I noticed in my notes that I had worked out a proof to, proof to my satisfaction that um, that that taking the segments of the tie line as a, the fraction of the tie line uh, <coughs> does indeed represent the relative fractions of the two uh, phases present. And you can do that by uh, writing a mass balance. I didn't, uh, I didn't ask that to be done on this question, but <coughs> but it would uh, on the <coughs> remember if we had a curve like that, and we said that when we have when we're in some region such as this, in the two phase region, and that the and that the calculated or, or the determined overall mass composition comes out to be some point here which I call B that <clears throat> that the two phases were that the that the fraction of the oil or organic phase was equal to A B over A C. <clears throat> the fraction of the water phase was equal to um, BC over AC. <clears throat> well, uh, uh, and of which, of course, the composition of the oil phase is given at point C in the composition of the oil phase at point C <clears throat> in the composition of the water phase. at uh, point A, in the way I've called it here. Now, by writing a mass balance with respect to, let's say, alcohol or water, you can prove that, that, that this is, a, that, that that <coughs> fraction uh, does uh, indeed represent the uh, relative masses of the two fractions present. <coughs> I thought I had my answer. I, don't, I guess I forgot to bring it in, the actual solution to that. But, <clears throat> but you can set up an algebraic equation by saying that, um, uh, <clears throat> by saying let, uh, let x equal to the, <clears throat> let's say, the mass of the uh, organic phase or the oil phase. And of course, 100 minus x would be, let's say, a basis of 100 grams or 100 mass units. <clears throat> 100 minus x would be the mass of the water phase. And so you'd say that, um, <clears throat> and this of course is over here, this is water. This is the uh, this is the isoamyl alcohol. And this is ethyl alcohol. <clears throat> so what you so in other words, uh, the <clears throat> notice here that if you want to write make some def definitive uh, type of uh, expression, or you wouldn't to distinguish between this and this, you wouldn't use the alcohol as a basis because it doesn't change much. This is almost parallel as far as alcohol content, the two phases of concern, is, but the water, so you'd write a mass balance with respect to, with respect to isolima alcohol. <clears throat> and I don't have what those figures are, where I could look them off, I could look them up here uh, for, a particular, for this example. And uh, um, for this particular example, we had them. Um, I believe I got. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay. Now this is with respect to isoamyl alcohol. This will write a mass balance here. In other words, uh, this is a way of calculating what the um, relative amounts are instead of determining it graphically. That's all I'm doing here. With respect to isoamyl mass balance would be 
would be um, X times whatever that composition came out to be, I got 70 and a half in my solution. I'm uh, reading it off the graph here. <laughs> about 7.7.705 <coughs> would be the amount of alcohol in the in the organic phase I mean the isolate of alcohol in the um, organic phase plus 100 minus X times the percent in I read off from the graph on in the water phase which I have recorded here is about um, or did I, I don't know if I wrote that down or not, but maybe it wasn't asked for. Oh, yes, 2.3 percent, or two and a half, something like that, times 0 0.023 would be equal to the overall, or in other words, the, the composition represented by point B, which was a uh, <coughs> This would be the overall, and uh, let me see. That uh, was um, I had down here. That the overall composition was uh, was about nine point three weight percent. Is that what you have? Yeah. So it'd be uh, is equal to. Um, in this case, I'd use a hundred grams of basin. So it'd be a hundred times zero point. <coughs> Oh, nine three. So if you saw that for x, x then of course is equal to the mass of the oil fraction. Mass of the oil fraction of the organic phase. <clears throat> and of course, one hundred minus that. And you can check that by writing a mass balance with respect to water. Because you know, you know the percentages of water. Theoretically, you could do it with this, right with respect to ethyl alcohol, but because the differences between the al and the alcohol contents are very, rather small, or you wouldn't get any very accurate answer. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so um, um, I believe my uh, I, let's see. I obtained a result that, uh, that indicated that the um, amount, of the, the mass fraction of the <clears throat> oil layer, uh, done, doing it graphically, was 0.104, or in other words, about 10 percent mass fraction of the total. And of course, the water phase would be the difference, or 0.89, uh, 897, or essentially 90 percent. <clears throat> Question. Well, that's the composition that this point comes to. I, I didn't. I do this a little exaggerated, but uh, because if, when you when you took your initial composition and diluted it by a factor of one plus by a factor of uh, three <coughs> or one plus two, this is where it came to. Or in other words, it came to, it was exactly one third of what the original concentration was. The original concentration was, according to my calculation, was um, <coughs> 27.9 weight percent, 28 weight percent. And of course, when you dilute it by a factor one to three, you divide it on a mass basis, why it's exactly one third of that. Come out to be 9.3. Okay. Well, okay. I'll look over your results and see how you got out. It's it's rather simple after you get the um, initial composition correctly established from the data I uh, indicated. Um, how do you proceed? <coughs> Well, how about the minimum amount of water to produce phase separation? Anybody got the answer to that? Hmm. The 
33%. How many? What percent? 33%. 33%. Yeah, I am. I had 32.8 is what I have. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think we'll accept that. <laughs> Mm. Again, what, what you do, of course, is write a. How, is, is, is determine what. You have to calculate how much water it takes to just come down to this point where it touches the curve. And so, again, you do it by writing a mass balance. Same technique as you do here. You calculate x. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we'll. Um, Stop with that right now. <clears throat> I thought I would uh, talk to you a little bit about this, this morning about federal laws and regulations, even though I'm not an expert in the field, but I, <clears throat> I know a little about it uh, from having been <coughs> exposed to it here. But anyway, um, anybody actively engaged in um, alcoholic beverage uh, industries has to be concerned with <clears throat> federal laws and regulations because it is one of the most regulated industries. I suppose for two reasons, or maybe the same reason uh, spelled out in another way. One, uh, one of course, is that <clears throat> the <clears throat> laws are particularly uh, <coughs> instigated by the, the uh, apparent need to control the consumption of alcoholic beverages in order to prevent its abuse of the social from a social standpoint and of course the way this is part of the way this is controlled <laughs> is by opposing imposing taxes. Now you might say at the present time whether or not the tax taxation is based on control for social purposes or merely to raise money. I suppose it'd be a point of contention there. <coughs> but, but anyway, it's one of them <coughs> because it is heavily taxed, particularly the distilled spirits aspect of it, of alcoholic beverages. <coughs> um, The industry is subject to considerable supervision and laws and regulations and inspection. <clears throat> well, fundamentally, the <clears throat> the uh, laws derived from a law, from a law, um, code of federal regulations, which is part of the law passed by Congress, and of course approved by the president. <clears throat> and so basically, we have uh, what's called the Code of Federal Regulations, and they cover a number of titles. And uh, the title that pertains to the production of alcoholic beverages is Title 26 of the Code of Federal Reg Regulations. <clears throat> with other numbers, you can look up in <coughs> catalogs of government publications, find out what they pertain to. Uh, offhand, I don't remember. Uh, one of these gives a list of what some of the titles are. Is this alcoholic beverages? <coughs> this is federal law. And alcoholic beverages includes, it comes under Title 26 of the Code of Federal Regulations. And the, par and the parts that are primarily concerned with uh, alcoholic beverages are parts uh, 
I was trying to see what some of the other parts referred to, but I didn't know. Uh, yeah, well, <clears throat> in the front of this book that does give not only the what the various parts of Title 26 stand for but or, or, or deal with, but also what the various other numbered titles deal with. For example, Title <clears throat> 14 has to do with aeronautics and space. Title 18, conservation of power. Title 7, agriculture, and so forth. But going here to Title 26, <clears throat> the, uh, um, which basically has a, is, is, Title 26 is called internal revenue. Deals with internal revenue in general. <clears throat> And, um, for example, paragraph one, uh, or part one, rather, has to do with the income tax. And uh, parts uh, 20 to 29 have to do with the state and gift taxes, for example. And then jumping up to parts 170 to 299, they deal with <clears throat> alcohol, tobacco, alcohol, tobacco, and other excise taxes. So I'll just write alcohol. <clears throat> tobacco and <clears throat> other excise taxes. And so, and then the and of course, then you can go on and uh, find um, <clears throat> numbers beyond that, except up to 600, which deal with various subjects uh, of, of internal revenue. <clears throat> well, anyway, these um, codes are given uh, are given uh, numbers. Uh, so in the, uh, you can buy a copy of the book such as this here by ordering it from the, from the <clears throat> U.S. government printing office in Washington. And uh, you will find that <clears throat> these are, there are a number of subparagraphs to these, to these paragraph numbers. For example, I'm looking here <coughs> at uh, <clears throat> paragraph 211.45. So this has to do with uh, industrial use permits, or, or, and the, that subparagraph about the condition of permits. This is just an example of, <clears throat> of how you look up from um, in the in the index what how you find it. They don't they don't give it by page numbers. They give the reference by paragraph numbers and subparagraph numbers. And um, there's various things in here that you can find. Printed in, in in these little booklets, which cover parts of it, dealing with a certain subject. For example, here is a, an excerpt from the Code of Federal Regulations <clears throat> entitled "Wine," and uh, it deals with uh, Part 240, which has, deals with wine. So, Part 240. which, of course, is included in that, has to do with wine. <clears throat> and um, oh, here's a several others. Here's beer, for example, is part 245. And uh, <clears throat> stills is part 196 has to do with still the requirements for requirements and regulations dealing with the manufacture and use of stills. Industrial alcohols, part, eight, part 182, <clears throat> and um, and uh, other uh, and uh, various other things. The stills. Uh, 
I had another publication I forgot to bring in here it's called Distilled, Distilled Spirits Plants. Not, oh yes, here it is, part 201. I better write that one down. <clears throat> part 201 deals with uh, Distilled Spirits Plants. And of course, <clears throat> and so you can order these booklets separately. <coughs> Or you can even even buy the whole code, the whole title, and uh, get it in one book. But the trouble is that they're usually changed before you get them. I mean, they're out of date before you get them. <clears throat> or it depends on the period of time, how how active the laws have been. Um, the Congress is in changing the laws and making amendments. <clears throat> But nevertheless, um, um, well, for example, here when we ordered this book, this was a title. Uh, this title here was uh, revised as of January 1st, 1964. But when we received it, though, that much of it was cut out, and the, the supplement supplied, which was the <laughs> changes as of 1964. Now, <clears throat> some. Some changes have now been taken have taken place uh, since then, uh, having to do with the change or reorganization of the Treasury Department to remove uh, to remove the supervision or of um, alcoholic beverages from the from the <coughs> from the Internal Revenue Service of the Treasury Department, establishes a separate um, bureau. So now that's uh, considerably confused, and I don't even have the update regulations in it because the <clears throat> instead of having the what used to be called the <clears throat> the um, um, well, it went through various phases, but we used to be called ATTD for many for many years. It was what was called the alcohol. Tobacco Tax Division <clears throat> of Internal Revenue Service. <clears throat> About two years ago, Division of the of Internal Revenue for Service. So many people would either speak of the ATTD or they talk about the IRS. But now uh, the uh, <clears throat> Is no longer under our <clears throat> under our IRS, but now we have the Bureau <coughs> of uh, <clears throat> Alcohol. To Tobacco and firearm, firearms. And uh, it has abbreviation now BATF, <clears throat> sort of the, who you refer to now. Well, even, even after it's called ATFD, they had a change and it went to ATFD, which, which, did, which included the firearms. <clears throat> but so anyway, uh, these are the, these are the, what the changes are at the present time. Now, <clears throat> as far as the organization is concerned, and I haven't seen publications put out since this has has been <clears throat> has been uh, changed. But anyway, the the new publications will at least will not have the Internal Revenue Service printed on the t on it here. It'll simply have Bureau of Alcohol. Back on Farms Division of the Treasury Department. <clears throat> now, I want to make one more point in the connection with this, and that is that because things are changing rapidly, many, most offices and, and um, firms that have need to have the up-to-date regulations subscribe to a service commercial service which is called Commerce Clearinghouse CCH 
I had an excerpt here one from one. Of, here's one. <clears throat> here's a little excerpt from one of the regulations having to do with wine. I, uh, I just happened to have get it a couple of days ago, having to do with permissible additives to wine, and so this is. A, but anyway, you see, it's down at the bottom. It gives the Code of Federal Regulations, 26 CFR, paragraph 240.1051. Down at the bottom, it says 1973, Commerce Clearinghouse Incorporated. <clears throat> so many people, including uh, the government itself, subscribe to this service for its officers, such as the uh, gaugers and inspectors out in the field. They, they, uh, they subscribe to this service. I don't know what cost what it costs, but it costs too much for us to afford, so we don't we don't subscribe to it. But <clears throat> but anyway, the most the commerce clearinghouse. CCH is called. <clears throat> is um is a source of of, of having um and an up-to-date file, for example, when you scribe the service, you have a loose leaf notebook, and any time there's a significant any change, or well, they'll send out a revised page to replace the old one in your book, or added pages if necessary. <clears throat> well, there's one other title of the Code of Federal Regulations I thought I'd mention, that is um, Title 27, which is... Uh, Entitled uh, <clears throat> "Intoxicating Liquors," and it really has to do with it really has to do with the advertising and labeling re regulations of, of alcoholic beverages <clears throat> and standards of identity. In other words, these parts I've referred to here will cover the various production regulations, the <coughs> rules you have to conform to, and and permissible. <coughs> Operations. <clears throat> Title 27, dealing with intoxicating liquors. It was originally referred to as the FAA Amendment, the Federal Alcohol Administration Act, which <clears throat> Federal Alcohol Administration Act, which was uh, passed along about 1940, as I recall, and for the first time set up a sort of a code of and laws and regulations concerning what could be advertised and how it could be advertised and, and, uh, and how your things could be labeled. For a while, this was operated under a separate administration. Then later, it was turned over to the <clears throat> then um, Bureau of Internal Revenue, and uh, now, of course, it's still it's still it's still a responsibility with the BATF <clears throat> Division of the Treasury for enforcement. And so uh, this is a shorter uh, regu regulation, but it's quite important, especially for the people who are concerned with getting the, putting the labels on and uh, getting them out. So anyway, I wanted to mention <clears throat> this because there's also a little yellow book covering this, Title 27. And so uh, if you turn to... A certain part here, which is um, some part C of paragraph 5, it has standards of identity for distilled spirits. So I want to, so this uh, is what I was leading up to. I wanted to discuss that a little bit, <clears throat> especially as far as brandies are concerned. <clears throat> so we have, well, Title 27. <clears throat> Part 5 
is entitled <coughs> Labeling, Labeling, Advertising, and Distilled Spirits. Title four, part four has to do with the label and advertising of wines, incidentally. <clears throat> and then subpart um, subpart C are standards of identity. For distilled spirits. Well, anyway, <clears throat> um, it's a very lengthy and rather involved thing, and in many cases, it is, it, <clears throat> the, especially as far as the brain is concerned, it, um, could, to a considerable extent, is based on what you can't do rather than what you can do, as far as the labeling is concerned. But anyway, <clears throat> so I think I will turn over here then to... Um, what's called class four brandy and uh, and just read an excerpt or two out of it. <clears throat> so it starts out by saying that brandy is a, yeah, I need to try to write these down because uh, you, you can get them out of this if you want to. But <clears throat> the brandy is an alcoholic distillate from the fermented juice, mash, or wine or fruit, or from the residue thereof, produced at less than 190 proof in such a manner that the distillate possesses a taste, aroma, and characteristic generally attributed to the product, and ball it not less than 80 proof. Then it goes on to say, brandies are a mixture thereof, not conforming to any of the standards in subparagraphs one through eight, shall be designated brandy, and um, such designation shall be immediately followed by a truthful and adequate statement of the composition. <coughs> So then it goes on to give these eight subparagraphs or qualifications. And so it's a, <clears throat> and, uh, and the first one has to do with fruit brandy. First that had to do with fruit brandy. And, um, and uh, in, in essence, the essential part of that paragraph is it says that fruit brandy other than, other than grape brandy and derived from one variety of fruit shall be designated by the word brandy qualified by the name of such fruit. For example, if you, you have to use the word of the fruit, like peach brandy or <clears throat> apricot brandy or whatever, if it's, uh, if it's made from that fruit. In the case of grape brandy, you can use the word grape, but it's optional, and most times it's omitted. So the implication is that it doesn't have, not, does not have the name of the fruit in front of the label, it's grape brandy. <clears throat> There's also a subparagraph or a, part, a sentence in this same paragraph which says that fruit brandy derived from more than one variety of fruit shall be designated as fruit brandy qualified by a truthful and adequate statement of the composition. So in other words, you can make you could use a mixed fruit, medium and fermented. <clears throat> and I might say that we've been kind of interested in this because of the interest in working with pears, a rather expensive fruit with a low yield, and we've done some experiments now that make a mixture of grape and pear. And, uh, and I don't know whether it potentially would ever be useful, <laughs> but, it might, but it makes her give it, uh, about a third of pears mixed with um, grape juice gives a rather nice flavored, lightly pear-like aroma and flavor to the product. And, uh, what do you call that? Do you call that pear brandy? No, you'd have to call it pear-grape brandy or grape pear brandy. You'd have to put the both names on the label. And so... Uh, so the uh, advertising manager would probably say, "Well, this is a this is a, a stumbling block right to start with, and uh, they're very sensitive about labels so and how they might appeal to the consumer." <clears throat> well, anyway, it goes on <clears throat> and dis discusses 
whole part of, about fruit brandy here, and then uh, then <clears throat> various other things here. For example, another, par another paragraph specifically describes cognac brandy as the that distilled in the cognac region of France was entitled to be so designated by the laws and regulations of the French government. <clears throat> so we cannot use the word cognac and on anything unless it's produced from the cognac region of France that is defined by the French government. <clears throat> this is the only one, however, that is defined in, the, in, the, in our regulations. Why, if we can use burgundy and all the rest of the county and cognac, do we have that powerful of a lot? <laughs> it's because we uh, we haven't uh, we haven't made an agreement agreement with the French government on that. We have made an agreement with the French government on the on the use of the word cognac, <clears throat> and they have reciprocated by agreeing to uh, respect the term bourbon as, a, as an authentic de designation of American products, American they whiskey. Any whiskey do they? No, but anything <laughs> imported. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my well, I would say they don't make any, but they don't make very much if they do. But anyway, <clears throat> anyway, any product sold as bourbon in France would uh, would not be permissible unless it came from the U.S. and produced under the regulations appropriate for that here. <clears throat> for example, Armagnac, another well-known brandy of France, is not spe specifically spelled out here. <coughs> Generally speaking, I don't think <clears throat> they went. Uh, they wouldn't let you use the word Armagnac on a label, but uh, but it isn't specifically prohibited by these um, by these regulations as are presently spelled out. Next paragraph it deals with dried fruit brandy. In other words, if you use dried fruit, you have to use some term which indicates that. For example, uh, if it's made from dried grapes or raisins, it has to be labeled raisin brandy. So in practice, some of these uh, restrictions sort of preclude their use in commerce as a, as a product of consumer use. In other words, some, some raisins are turned into brandy, but they are used as wine spirit, you know, for fortification of wine. But if they wanted to be turned into a, a product to be labeled and sold and, and at retail in the commerce, in the, in the marketplace, they'd have to be labeled raisin brandy. Lee's, Lee's brandy is paragraph four. Paragraph five, pumice brandy or mar, or mark brandy. Paragraph six deals with residue brandy. And so I might read that uh, part of that. Par paragraph six, residue brandy is brandy distilled wholly or in part from the fermented residue of fruit or wine and shall be designated as res residue brandy qualified by the name of the fruit from which derived. Now, in other words, then, a lot of the <clears throat> products that we make in the wine industry are, uh, are residue brandy, technically, but this course is also comprises part of the general definition of wine spirit. It can be used for fortification of wines. <clears throat> but, it, but it does preclude a practice that used to be followed uh, by some people here in California of taking combining wine making and brandy making and, and for example <clears throat> crushing the grapes and draining off the juice to make wine from the juice and then using the residue to make beverage brandy. It, in some cases it might make a pretty good product. Uh, as a matter of fact there was, was there were some a few labels uh, and up until maybe 20 some years 25 years ago <clears throat> which were made in that way by a few firms in the coastal district, which had a re renown for their wine and also <clears throat> to a certain extent for their brandy, and they used the residues. But this is illegal. You can, uh, you don't have, you have to make brandy for beverage purposes or that which does not incur this qualification of residue brandy by using either the, the juice from the whole fruit or the whole fruit. And this brings up a few interesting <clears throat> technicalities that, uh, that apply. Uh, but what's your question first? Um, is that enforced, though, the residue brandy <clears throat> law? Well, it's supposed to be, as far as I know it is. Really? And it has, it has stopped some practices 
some some um, practices of individual, certain firms from that I know in the past. Now I'm not saying it doesn't go on. <clears throat> and, uh, but as an overall practice, it doesn't. It's not permissible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I so what I was leading into was a some rather interesting technical questions, and that, that has to do with the fact that you can, as I said before, you you crush grapes and drain off the juice and use that separately for wine purposes. You cannot use the residue for uh, distilling into brandy without incurring the appellation qualifying qualifying appellation of residue brandy. However, you can uh, <clears throat> ferment the dryness on the skins, which may make a poorer product in, in reality uh, because of that part of the practice, drain off the wine and then press the pumice and wash it with all the, all the water you want to use to recover the alcohol and combine the washings with the, with the main wine and distill that. However, you can't, uh, you can't ferment on the skins, remove the juice, keep that separately, and wash the pumice residue and call that brandy. But you have to, if, if you mix it with the original wine, this is all right. This means then you, <clears throat> then you have um, the press wine and the uh, washings are simply uh, part of the original fermentation by recovery techniques. So, um, And I might mean, <clears throat> so many. So of course, there's no objection to using only, only the only the free run juice or the wine part. For example, if you have um, operations involving production of beverage brandy as well as wine making, uh, where well, you can <clears throat> you can crush grapes, drain off the juice, and um, ferment that for distilling wines, and add water or however you want to process <clears throat> the residue and ferment that and distill that in the high proof spirits it legally would be residue brandy or, res or, or residue <clears throat> that depends on the proof of distillation of course of what it's called residue brandy or, or neutral spirit and then then of course you can use that in any type of wine making now you can then get it back into the buried brandy form by fortifying wine, and uh, and uh, and uh, for example, you can fortify up to 23.9 percent. <clears throat> Call it share mat if you want, like unbaked share material. You can distill that, and that's called buried brandy. So in a way, you've got it all back in the brandy after all, by the by the permissible practice of uh, distilling fortified materials. And other practices that uh, related to these sort of things are, well, uh, two of the plants that I know of uh, crush the grapes, drain off the juice, and then they wash the pumice rather intently with water to extract the residual sugar, then add the diluted water to the original juice and ferment that. And that's all legal because still the, 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 uh, for <coughs> the wine that's produced or the distilling material that's produced is produced from the whole fruit. It's all combined. This is a practice used at the Malasal Vineyards, the Reedley, the Christian Brothers, where they <coughs> They drain all, they wash the residue about three times, I remember, using a kind of a counter, counter current process where water goes into the previously twice washed residue and that from that then counter current so that <clears throat> dilute, or dilute sugar washes run, run into the fresh pumice and then that's all added to the drained off juice. So they actually get an alcohol content of their <clears throat> distilling material of I've forgotten now, between 7 and 9 percent, representing that much dilution from the water washing. But that, of course, is strictly legal because all the alcohol that's produced by the fermentation is derived from the, from the whole fruit. None of it's been diverted to other uses. 
There's another plant that uh, I think now use essentially the same process, but uh, up until a few years ago, they they simply from produce nothing but beverage brandy by crushing and fermenting on the skin. <clears throat> And then, of course, they wash the pressed and wash the pumice and add that wash material to the filling wine, and that's still still legal. As a matter of fact, on their label, they say they say, as I remember, uh, distilled from the whole grape. <laughs> you emphasize the word "whole." Well, <clears throat> um, now a couple other points in connection with this, and that is. <clears throat> Number seven of these qualifying regulations refers to neutral brandy, and it, it simply says a neutral brandy is brandy produced at more than 170 proof, and so forth. And then substandard brandy is that is a, is a paragraph which put in here to preclude the use of certain things. For example. Substandard brandy shall be a part of the designation for brandy, which is distilled from fermented juice, mash, or wine having a volatile acidity, calculated acetic acid exclusive SO2 in excess of two tenths gram per hundred cc's. In other words, two tenths percent is above that cannot be distilled into brandy without being called substandard, and that in effect then precludes its use as a <clears throat> as a beverage brandy. And it goes on to add another paragraph, uh, brandy, which has been distilled from unsound, molded, diseased, or decomposed fruit, mash, wine, lees, and so forth. Now, s and sometimes this regulation hasn't been enforced in the past. Sometimes fruit has been processed that's not, that is moldy or f but contaminated, in my opinion. <clears throat> is that for distilled spirits or is it Well, if... In other words, if you if you distill it over 190 proof, well, then it's not it's no longer called brandy, as you remember. Now we're, and then it's called uh, fruit spirits or neutral grape spirit. And so uh, theoretically, uh, if you could distill 190 proof or larger, why well, none of these qualifications apply because um, the neutral spirit is supposed to be neutral from whatever source. Of course, it isn't strictly that neutral, but uh, <clears throat> but on the other hand. Um, you see, as I read here at the start of this paragraph, uh, brandy is proved at less than 190 proof. So if it's over 190 proof, it's called wine spirit or Greek neutral spirit. That, of course, is eligible to be used in uh, fortification of wine, just as if it, were, if it was produced at 189 or 190 proof. That <clears throat> difference there changes the designation from brandy over to spirit. Proof of distillation. Uh, so, <clears throat> what I was <clears throat> mentioning then is <clears throat> to give a very straightforward definition of buried brandy, uh, that which is qualified to be labeled brandy without qualification, is determined by finding out. <clears throat> to make sure that none of these qualifications have to apply. In other words, uh, none of these limitations. <clears throat> then there's another paragraph goes on here. Well, of course, there's classes like rum, tequila, and of course, whiskey, the various types of whiskey are described in here. And uh, then, I, then I think I might conclude by making a brief reference to class eight, uh, cordials and liqueurs. And uh, it describes cordials and liqueurs and does not distinguish between the two terms obtained by mixing or redistilling distilled spirits with or over flowers, fruit, plants, or pu pure juices therefrom, and other natural flavoring extracts, and so forth and so on. Containing sugar, dextrose, or levulose in a combination of an amount not less than two and a half percent by weight of the finished product. So in other words, the point I make here is that if you took brandy and sweetened it to have more than two and a half percent, well then it's technically called a liqueur or cordial. 
So this brings up the, one other class that's defined here, but, which is related to it, class nine, flavored brandy and flavored gin and so forth. And uh, this is this is provide this provides that the the name of the predominant flavor shall appear as part of the designation. And um, And, uh, <clears throat> and has to be bottled at less, at not less than 70 proof. Um, and so most of those that you find flavored brandies are bottled at 70 proof. Because they use the minimum, they, in other words, they use the minimum uh, permissible. <clears throat> it's a, and then it further says that a, well, I guess it does not require that uh, that the um, um, flavored brandies have more than two and a half percent by sugar, but most of them do have. And it does say if the finished product contains more than two and a half percent of sugar. Um, no, no, that's no. This has to do with the volume of wine that's added. No, so <clears throat> um, in most cases, these so-called flavored brandies you see in the market, flavored uh, apricot brandy and peach brandy, and so forth, are strictly speaking, in my opinion, uh, <clears throat> cordials and liqueurs because they contain more more than two and a half percent sugar. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> we stop there and. Uh,